Heavenly Father, we've come to worship. And we pray that you will open up the heavens right now. That we can see your glory. And in the midst of a world torn and suffering and pain and heartache, May we see the love, that eternal compassion of Jesus and find peace, rest, comfort that we might praise his name even now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What a beautiful name is Jesus. I love what Hillary did early in the week and asked me, Uncle Bing, I'm supposed to Tell the children's story. What are you speaking about? So I can relate my story to the sermon. And yet Google Home and Amazon's Alexa will identify Muhammad, Buddha, and Satan, but not Jesus. You know what Alexa is? Alexa is a personal assistant. Google has one. Amazon has one. Is able to play music for you, turn on your TV, plan your schedule, give you a menu, all sorts of stuff. It's almost a robot. It's funny, the first time I encountered Alexa was when we were of a small group in Stacy's apartment. Before we started, Alexa, play this song. Stacy, Stacy, who are you talking to? He was talking to Alexa. That's Alexa right there. That's Alexa. It's funny, huh? Uh, so you start talking to Alexa and Google Home, and you ask them about Muhammad, Buddha, and Sid, and they know these people, but ask them about Jesus. The reply is, I do not know the name. Uh, there's a very big complaint about this. In fact, Mr. Richard Dawkins, the primary hostile atheist today, who has attacked the existence of God, very foul mouth, said, a serious historical case can be made that Jesus never lived at all. And it's been made by Professor G.A. Wells of London University. People who are not astute and just grab him because he's an Oxford professor, he knows what he's talking about, will not do the research. But if you do the research, G.A. Wells is a professor indeed, but he is a professor of German languages. He's got nothing to do with history, and he claims that Jesus never lived. This guy, his name is John Dixon. He's uh, the founding director of the Center for Public Christianity in Sydney. And he gave this challenge in Facebook. Can you guys read that? My glasses play playing tricks with me. He says, um, if I'll eat a page of my Bible, if anyone can find a single professor of ancient history, the classics, the New Testament, in a real accredited university anywhere in the world who thinks Jesus didn't live. And John Dixon is saying, my Bible has been saved so far. The largest ancient history department in Australia, students will probably find as many historical tomes on Jesus of Nazareth as on Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great combined. Macquarie University, one of the leading universities in Sydney, very early Christian sources and several non-Christian, even hostile sources, attest the existence of Jesus in the first century Palestine, putting his existence beyond reasonable doubt. C.S. Lewis said this, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. I was listening to Tim Keller this morning in my devotions, and Tim Keller is saying, Romans 1 says, all heavens declare the glory of God. And he said, really all people who say God does not exist really believe that God exists. They only deny that he exists. And it's really so senseless that we're like a lunatic putting out the sun by scribbling darkness in our cells to deny the existence of God. An evangelist in his eloquence penned his words, and let me read them to you. The names of the past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of the past scientists, philosophers, and theologians have come and gone. But the name of this man multiplies more and more. Though time has spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the mockers at his crucifixion, 
He still lives. His enemies could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. He stands forth upon the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by devils as the reason, personal Christ, our Lord and Savior. Today, let me present to you the embodiment that is in Jesus Christ, the glory of God. We find in Jesus the divine purpose, the divine power, and the divine presence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This was spanned by John. And it is amazing if you read Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. Right smack in the middle of the Gospels is John. John wrote a Gospel proclaiming that Jesus is God, the ego. And according to William Barclay, when John wrote his gospel, right about AD 60, there must have been 100,000 Greeks in the church for every Jew who was a Christian. The task of the Christian church was to create in the Greek world a predisposition to receive the Christian message. You've heard of the term, the grandeur that was Rome and the glory that was Greece. At the point of the writing of the Gospels, Rome was the imperial empire all over the world. And yet, even if Rome conquered Greece, Greece actually conquered Rome in terms of culture. Because it was Hellenism and the Grecian culture that pervaded all the Roman territories. What was this kind of thinking? Of course, Aristotle is a third of the philosophers of the Greeks, very respected, pervading the culture of the Caesars. And according to him, in the Aristotelian cosmology, there is a sphere, the terrestrial and the celestial sphere. The terrestrial changes, it's mutable. The celestial is immutable. The composition of the terrestrial sphere is four elements, earth, wind, water, and fire. And if you look at all the world, all of these elements can be summarized in earth, wind, water, and fire. But when you go to the celestial, it says, there must be a fifth essence out of the four essences of earth, wind, water, and fire that summarizes all the essences. That's why we come up with the word, what's the word? The quintessence. Why is it the quintessence? It's the fifth essence from the four essences. And according to the Greek mind, that quintessence and summarized in one word called logos. It means word, reason, or plan. In Greek philosophy and theology, the divine reason implicit in the cosmos, ordering it and giving it form and meaning. In other words, logic, the derivative, is the science of reasoning. To the Greek, logos, or the word, is the divine reason. There must be a purpose for what we are here for, and John said, I'm going to use the word to reach the Greek mind. Paul counters and says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rules or authorities. All things were created, what? Through him and for him. We will talk about the instrumentality of creation in the second part of the sermon, but right now in the first part, we will talk about for him. All creation was made for the glory of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 43, 6-7, God says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, whom I created, what? For my glory. We were created not for ourselves, but to glorify God. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put eternity in man's hearts, forever beats in every heart. What does that mean? Let's look at the life of Solomon. Supposedly, if you Google him, he is the richest man in all of history. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it. And again, all was vanity and a chasing after the wind. According to the Bible, the collection of Solomon every year was 25 metric tons of gold. There was so much gold in the kingdom of Solomon that silver had no value. That's how rich Solomon was. And he said... All is vanity. You know what he said? After I conducted the most exhaustive research on happiness and how to become happy, this is my conclusion. 
The end of the whole matter, let us hear. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole of man. Most translation says, this is the whole duty of man. I like Young's literal translation, which means, for this is the whole of man. This is not just the duty of man. It is the purpose of man to fear God and worship him. Place Pascal, who penned this, can probably help us explain what that means. That was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is emptiness, which he tries in vain to fill with everything around him. However, an infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, God himself. Before Caesar crossed the Rubicon and founded the Imperial Roman Empire and asserted sovereignty all over the world, the last battle he fought was the Battle of Alicia. The Gallic Wars, where Vercingetorix, the general of the Gauls, fell to Caesar. Very touching in the end when Getorix, Vercingetorix people were dying and of hunger because they were, their resources had been depleted and Caesar has closed them in in the fort. He went before Caesar and presented himself, laid down his sword, took away his armor and prostrate on the ground. He told this to Caesar. I give you my own life so that you might let my men live. If my men die, there will be nothing left of the goals. No one left to worship our gods. Vercingetorix, the goals were not just thinking about their survival. They were thinking about they're gods and worshiping gods. In every culture of the world, there is this urge to worship somebody who is natural, supernatural. I love this illustration. I think nothing better can illustrate this today. Americans who are so addicted to sports. Deion Sanders, one of the most celebrated athletes in America. How is he so celebrated? Because Deion Sanders was the only athlete who scored a grand slam home run in baseball in that week and in the same week he also scored a touchdown he was playing both football and baseball in that season what did he say playing for the Dallas Cowboys he said it happened the night we won the Super Bowl finally won the Super Bowl I just finished ordering my Lamborghini and I lay there in bed thinking every goal I had ever attempted had now been reached yet I was emptier than ever before that was the night I got on my knees. Only God is big enough to fill this heart of mine. Philam Church, you may not like Dion Sanders, but I know you would love this guy. His name is Manny Pacquiao. According to sports writer, he was the greatest fighter since Genghis Khan, when Asia, an Asian fighter, took over the West. Nobody can probably repeat what Manny Pacquiao has done. He's earned so many titles in so many divisions. And when Nike put together a poster to advertise Manny Pacquiao, they did not show a high-energy scene where he's pummeling an opponent to the canvas. But they did this, because whenever you watch Manny Pacquiao play, and fight in the ring. He does something before the bout begins. What does he do? You find him at the corner of his ring, kneeling to God. So Nike basically saying, bend your knees to God. Just do it. Because God's purpose is for you to glorify him. Not only does Jesus embody God's purpose, he embodies God's power. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Let all the earth fear the Lord, that all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Let me walk you through what that means. This is our spiral galaxy. We live in this galaxy. It's called the Milky Way. If you span this galaxy, it will take you 100,000 light years to figure out the end of one, one end of the Milky Way to the other. What is 100,000 light years? Let me give it to you. A light year is a unit of measurement 
to measure the distance that light can travel at a speed of 186,000 miles per second in a year. Make that 100,000 and you can span our galaxy. Let me take you back. Astronomer David Conright used a rough estimate of 10 trillion galaxies in the universe. Multiplying that by the Milky Way's estimated 100 billion stars results in one with 24 zeros after it. Now that's quantum mechanics, numbers we can't understand. Let me help you understand this. Everybody has cell phones, everybody has computers, and now the moment you measure data, how do we measure data? I see that in my cell phone, you're running out of data. Go to the cloud. If you, for 50 cents a month, I can add 50 gig to you. What is 50 gig? Let's go through this. Used to be when I was in my age, used to be with buying K or kilobytes was already expensive. But we went and bought megabytes of data. That's one million characters. A gigabyte is one billion characters. A terabyte is what? One trillion characters. A petabyte is 1,000 terabytes, and you go all the way, and make, let me make you understand, it is estimated that the proliferation of computers and mobile devices will happen soon. And you know what? In the year 2025, a connected person will interact with connected devices nearly 4,800 times per day, one in every 18 seconds. The world will have 163 zettabytes of data by 2025. What's a zettabyte? That's a zettabyte. You know how many stars there are in the universe? One Yoda byte. Yoda byte? <laughs> What's a Yoda byte? Take it back again. This is the Earth. All right? Let's move back. We move back up to the orbit of Jupiter. See, where's the sun? The sun is right there. That's the Earth. Let's move back some more. This is the entire solar system where you have Pluto right here. And where I cannot see us anymore. And then 12.5 light years from the sun, we can see neighboring stars. You got Proxima. You got Alpha Centauri. Move another 250 light years from the sun, a lot more neighboring stars. The universe within 5,000 light years, you will see the Orion arm. The universe within 50,000 light years, you finally see the entire Milky Way galaxy. You know where we are? Somewhere there on the side of the Milky Way. And I love the author of our quarterly. He was my professor in science and scripture when he was dean in the seminary, Dr. Norman Gali. He had to read three books in a week for his class. It was only two credits. I can never forget that, the punishment we had to endure. But in one of the books that I read in this class, he said, in order to understand this, this is what you do. You get a drinking glass, put it on top of the North American continent, board a spacecraft, look for the drinking glass in the North American continent, and that would be the size of our solar system compared to our galaxy. There is the universe within 500,000 light years. We find satellite galaxies because if there's 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. There is the universe within 5 million light years. Now you have local group of galaxies. And there is the universe within 100 million light years. We now have super clusters of galaxies. And then the universe within one billion light years, the neighboring supercluster, until you find the entire universe within 14 billion light years. Before Stephen Hawking died, he was prognosticating that somehow there is not only one universe, there might be multiverses all over us, which we do not know. It's mind-boggling. And yet the Bible says, he determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Every star in that vast universe has been named by God, and he knows them by name. That's how great God is. European Space Agency's Planck probe reported that the universe is 13.79 billion years old. How do you quantify that? Based on astronomical calculation, they can predict the gravitational forces in the orbits and will tell you, take you back to what has happened. And according to the Big Bang Theory, we started in a point of singularity, that black hole, only the size of the tip of a pencil, and it exploded, and we have the universe. 
one guy who got the Nobel Prize award, his name is Brian Smith. He said, I can take you back via formula and calculation to a second old before the universe started. He said, through calculations, I'll give you all the formula. He said, Mine is a brilliant as Stephen Hawking. And I'll walk you through until we go back 13.8 billion years ago. And you will be at the point of singularity. And he was asked, though, what happened before the point of singularity? What did he say? Before that, all things become fuzzy. I do not know where the Big Bang started, where that black hole was. So Einstein says, what I see convinces me God exists. What I cannot see confirms it. Immanuel Kant, one of the most celebrated philosophers in the Renaissance, said, two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The more often and steadily we reflect upon them, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Al chimes in again, and here's what Al says. We are but a speck in an unfathomably large universe. The more we gain insight into its mysterious forces, cosmic and atomic, the more we harness the huge power of these forces, the more such humility becomes an imperative. <sighs> awesome, outside us in the sky. What do we do when we look inside us? A single strand of human DNA would fill a thousand volume encyclopedia of comprising 600,000 pages with 500 words on each page. Can hardly wait. Lily will finally have a sister. And how that baby will look, I know you say it's going to look like the grandpa, but that's not what I mean. Uh, how the baby will look depends on the DNA structure that God gives to the baby. What does that mean? One DNA, a human genome, four nucleotides with three billion characters will take 96 years to read if read one character per second. That's how you are. That's how I am. We are DNA structures. And you know what the Bible says? For you formed my inward parts, O oh God. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. The same God who created the vast universe was the same God who created you and who created me and formed my DNA structure. Jesus is an embodiment of God's purpose. He is also the embodiment of God's power. More importantly, though, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. James Irvin, I'd like to read this. It's very touching. When he joined the Apollo 15 mission, while they were moving farther and farther away from the earth, is what he said. The earth reminded us of a Christmas tree ornament hanging in the blackness of space. As we got farther and farther away, it diminished in size. Finally, it shrank to the size of a marble, the most beautiful marble you can imagine. The beautiful, warm, living object looked so fragile, so delicate, that if you touch it with a finger, it would crumble and fall apart. Seeing this has to change a man has to make a man appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. And here comes what he said that really strikes me. God walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. There was one way God said, I can be real to you in my presence. You know what you need to do? Build me a tabernacle. Give me a sanctuary. And the Shekinah glory will be right there. I will be right there present with you in the sanctuary. But you know what? The teaching in the Old Testament. But he said, you cannot see my face. For men shall see me, not see me and live. Moses was saying, oh God, oh God, we've been talking for so long. Let me see you. And God said, no, Moses, no man can see me and live because God is a consuming fire. That's why 
in the sanctuary was called the place holy of holies or the most holy place. And in the most holy place is what we call the Shekinah glory. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. Right on top of the Ark of the Covenant, inside, inside the Holy of Holies, are two cherubim, the symbols of cherubim. And they're saying, right in the middle of those two angels is the presence of God. And let me, understand, let me make you understand what that means. No one can go into the most holy place except for the high priest, and he only does it every year. Exodus 28, 33, and 35. On the hem of the high priest, make bells of gold, and that shall be an Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out so that he does not die. No man can see God and live. And if you read the account of the Day of Atonement, the only day when the, whole, the, high, priest, the, most, the high priest can go into the most holy place, they burn incense so that it will be full of smoke. Somehow to cover the high priest. Because the priest can die if he utters a wrong word or act wrongly. He might die right there. And you know why they put bells in the hem of his robe? So that the assistance of the high priest can be sure that he is still alive if the bells are ringing. It is amazing that in the Talmud, they said during the second temple period, they assigned high priests who were corrupt. And people literally died in the Holy of Holies. So they introduced another tradition. You know what they did? They tied a rope around the waist of the high priest. You know why? Because if the high priest dies, there is no more contact with God. So we must have the cadaver of the high priest, so that if the high priest dies, they can pull the high priest from the holy place into from the most holy place to the holy place. And yet, two thousand years ago, there was a baby born, a wise man from the east, with a retinue of soldiers, came. They saw the child, barely two years old, with his mother, Mary. And upon seeing the child, what did they do? They bowed down and worshipped him. Let's go back to John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The literal translation of that verse is, and the word became flesh and tabernacled. Among us. Whereas people died in the presence of God. God said. I want to be with you. And I will be in the form. Where you will not be consumed. And destroyed by my glory. I will be in the form. Where you will be enthralled by my love. Standing by the temple courts one day. And Jesus said. I tell you. Something greater than the temple is here. What was he talking about? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Let me take you back to what Sandra said at the start of the worship segment. I don't know how Pastor David feels. I can just have my condolences to Richie. To know how Abner feels. You know, people suffering from pain and sickness and death. But there's one thing sure. The promise of God is that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Even in death. And that's greater than man walking on the moon. So I end with this, the favorite quote from Malcolm Muggeridge. I want you to watch the slides and read the words with me. And hopefully our hearts will be warmed into worship as we end. We look back in history and what do we see? Empires rising and falling, 
revolutions and counter-revolutions, wealth accumulating and wealth dispersed, one nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and fall of great ones that ebb and flow with the moon. In one lifetime, I've seen my own fellow countrymen ruling over a quarter of the world. The great majority of them convinced in the words of what is still a favorite song, that God has made the mighty would make them mightier yet. I've heard a crack craze Austrian proclaim the world, the establishment of a German Reich that would last a thousand years. An Italian clan announced that he would restart the calendar to begin his own assumption of power. I've heard a murderous Georgian brigand in the Kremlin acclaimed by the intellectual elite of the world as a wiser than Solomon, more enlightened than Ashoka, more humane than Marcus Aurelius. I've seen America wealthier and in terms of weaponry, more powerful than the rest of the world put together, so that Americans that they so wish could have outcome Adanda Alexander or Julius Caesar in their reigns and scale of their conquest. All in one lifetime, all gone with the wind. England, a part of a tiny island off the coast of Europe, threatened with dismemberment and even bankruptcy. Hitler and Mussolini dead, remembered only in infamy. Stalin, a forbidden name in the regime he helped found and dominate for some three decades. America haunted by fears of running out of those precious fluids that keep her motors roaring and the smug settling with troubled memories of the disastrous campaign in Vietnam and the victories of Don Quixote's of the media as they charged the windmills of Watergate, all in one lifetime, all gone, gone with the wind. Behind the debris of the self-styled sullen superman and imperial diplomatist, there stands the gigantic figure of one person because of whom, by whom, in whom and through whom alone mankind might still have hope, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus embodies God's unfathomable purpose. He's immeasurable and infinite power and His mind-boggling presence. Why? Because He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed in him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a beautiful name is Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, Jesus has won the victory, but the enemy is busy torturing us, making us suffer with pain and misery and even death. But we praise you because in Jesus is your purpose, your power, and your presence. And nothing, nothing can separate us from you not even death because of what he has done. And for that, dear Father, we give all our praise and adoration to you even now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before I leave her